started. I am so thrilled. Oh, this meeting is being recorded. I am so thrilled uh, that you can join us for the last plenary session. Um, Sophie Sparrow is a long friend of the Institute for Law Teaching and Learning. She's one of our consultants. We call her, she's one of the grown-ups, right? So uh, she's one of our go-to people, uh, a nationally known expert in a lot of things related to teaching and learning, has long been a supporter of online teaching, was on board before the other, the rest of us were. We were kind of like, oh, I don't really know. And in fact, Sophie is uh, one of the reasons we are having a conference on this particular topic. The other reason, as I will explain briefly, is tequila. Uh, <laughs> Sophie and I were at the uh, Institute conference that Washburn hosted a couple of years ago. We were catching up in the hotel bar as we frequently do. I don't remember quite the sequence of events, but it ended with the bartender feeding us tequila shots in the bar. So out of that if evening, Sophie convinced me, and apparently I agreed, uh, that we should definitely be doing some conferences and having conversations about online learning and how right she was even before the pandemic. So I am super thrilled uh, that Sophie's here. She's going to talk about building a positive online community or a positive learning community in various types of online spaces. So with that, Sophie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, hi everybody, welcome. Um, and this is about building positive learning committee uh, committees. That would be nice too, positive <laughs> learning committees. Positive learning communities without tequila. That's the challenge, that's what we're working on or yoga or anything else. So let me, um, this is always a little bit clunky so I apologize for that, but let me do screen share, I just have a, power some slides to show you so let me do that really quick um can you see these okay yes it's working all right so um i just want to say briefly uh other people have talked about like how we call this different learning and they're different things i happen to like one that i got from tessa dysart and tracy norton which is online, which is I line online, which is either synchronous or asynchronous in person. So that's the face to face stuff or in person in person and concurrently taught courses, which is like high flex or hyper flex or however you want to do it. Uh, that's what I did this whole past year. And I can tell you that it was the worst teaching experience probably of my life to have some people on Zoom and some people in the classroom. So I am really hoping that um, we don't have to do that again because that was really miserable. But I wanna welcome everybody. I hope you had a good comfort break as Michael described it, Michael from the Cayman Islands. And I thank you for still being here because it's the last session and I know it gets tiring. So I wanna thank all of you, um, especially the Institute for Teaching and Learning for those of you who are not aware of this and probably you should be if you're not. Um, ILTL and the Institute is a remarkable resource. Their conferences are awesome. I've met so many wonderful people through them and I've learned so much from them, including a number of the presenters who are here today. But Kelly, Lindsay, Emily, Sandra, and all of the presenters and participants, thank you. You are a great community. So I've got a challenge for you. Here's a quote, emotions detract from high level, rational and sophisticated cognitive processing. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get engaged immediately off the bat. So I want you to just pause and reflect about this and then post your reaction in the chat. And take your time, this is not a speed test. Great, um, great responses. Thank you. I've got yes and no. I've got the classic. 
it depends, totally gendered, sexist, emotional integration is key. I agree with it, but it's, um, I, I agree, but it's, uh, what was this say? I, but I, I know it's wrong, but I totally agree with this, that sentiment on a gut level. So lots of these different points. And so we're gonna talk about creating community is about creating and harnessing emotions to facilitate learning and deepen it. So one thing that this is from a wonderful book, which some of you may have heard about by um, Donald Finkel. I think I heard about this book first through an institute conference, but teaching is creating a space in which people learn. And it's a really interesting way to think about teaching. And so one of the things I do is I observe a lot of people's classes and offer to sit down their classes and give them feedback, whatever they want, or I have some suggestions. And oftentimes people say, well, it's not really a good class for you to watch because I'm not really doing anything. The students are working on a group project. And my response is that is teaching because you created this a project, you created the ability for students to work in small groups. And that is much harder to do and organize and to make work than to deliver a lecture. So if we have to think about teaching. And if we think about teaching, it's not about what, I mean, it is about what we do, but it's not about mm -hmm. our delivery. And people have already known this, and you, many of you have already talked about it in your sessions, about the importance of active learning. So I'm going to put you in breakout rooms. Kelly, I hope I can do that. Yes, OK, thank you. Um, these are going to be elevator conversations. This is not, I was born in France, and then I moved to Florida, and then I started teaching as an adjunct, and that, 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 No, that's not what we're doing. We're doing, we've got to be efficient and quick because we are all tired, and it's the end of the day for some of us. So I want you to tell your name. Um, I know your names are posted on Zoom, but people might not know how to pronounce your last name. So just quickly your name, the courses you teach, you don't have to say where you teach, just the courses you teach. And I want you to designate a chat reporter for your group. And I'm also gonna put this in the chat so that you can see it and you don't have to remember. And then the fourth one is your goal or question about creating community in a course. So what did you wanna get out of this session? Or you know, is there some problem you're working on that you think like, I wanna do better at creating community? So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to put you in breakout rooms. Let's see. Stop share. Breakout rooms. Thanks for your forbearance. Whoops. Sorry about that. Okay, now you should have that and I'm gonna put those questions in the, um, in the chat so that you're oriented. I'm gonna give you about five minutes and I'm gonna cue you as you go. So I'll periodically do those flash messages to all about like, okay, you've got two minutes left, you've got three minutes left, whatever. So you can keep on track. Any questions? Perfect, everybody's top of the class, great. In here too. Hi, Kelly. You're on mute. <laughs> always. Yeah, we always have a professor at our law school where he, we're always like, Dan, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> 
We only have gay three people? I, I, I don't know. Okay. Well, you can start, Manuel. Okay, uh, Manuel Del Valle versus uh, federal trial advocacy, federal motion practice, mediation, arbitration, and practice advocacy, and litigation theory, doctrine, and practice. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. And I don't want to be the chat reporter. <laughs> what did you hope to get out of the plenary session? Uh, I just like to get ideas. <laughs> Kelly, do you want to go? You and I know each other quite well, but Manuel doesn't know us. so. Yeah, um, so I teach an externship course. And um, I mean, just a very basic goal of doing a better job of creating community. Um, Sandra Simpson, pretty easy to pronounce, I think. Um, I teach legal research and writing one and two, three and four, and then I teach uh, civil procedure and real estate. And I think I've become I'm coming more aware of, you think that I would have already been aware of this, but the, the different backgrounds of our students that are not visible. And so I want to really get some ideas about how creating community across the across the cultures and across the socioeconomic status and across the genders and personalities. And so hoping to get some great ideas for that. Mm -hmm. So you, you teach writing? I do. Okay. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, there's no good writing, only good rewriting. Ah, that's really good. I'm always looking for people to quote. I might have to quote that in my opening video, which I learned about during this conference. I think I'm going to do an introductory video for my students. You're welcome video. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, I've never done that before, but now it feels like it's easy, right? Because we You can do a Zoom. You can go right into Zoom, record yourself, take the clip, send it to everybody. Do you use Dropbox yeah. or whatever to do that? That's easy. I know. And it's like, I didn't like the pandemic, but I kind of liked what it forced me to learn. Because um, I never would have done it. Kelly and I were like a hybrid conference, an online conference. Oh, I don't know. Well, originally I was like, Zoom, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, now everybody knows, right? Yeah. Now it's a verb. You know, yeah. you want to Zoom? <laughs> yeah, all right. I've done uh, video conferencing trials for 10 years. So wow, to really? The switch, to the switch over from the judicial video conference to this was kind of easy. In fact, Where do you I, have, teach? I have more capacity when I was doing video conferencing. I was the uh, chief administrative law judge for social security in Puerto Rico. Oh. So um, we have all kinds of equipment. I mean, I can literally zoom in to the witness or counsel right into their face. What do they have next to it? I can actually see what they had in the procession. Oh. Yeah, I can't do that with Zoom, but I could definitely do that with, <laughs> with the other equipment, which was all encrypted. So uh, huh. this changeover was, oh yeah. And I've always used some videos and PowerPoints, uh, but more videos. I assign videos for students to watch on litigation practice. I don't assign text to read. Mm. I use text in class to read, uh, for to perform. But I also teach acting as part of my advocacy. Uh, so, it, you know, when I do writing, I talk about value added. Mm -hmm. You know, a writing teacher gets is required to read your writing. Nobody else's. So, what's the value you're giving or providing that would interest somebody in your writing? Wouldn't that change the way you would write? So, mm -hmm. University, University of Chicago has a lot on that the value added way of refocusing writing. Uh, hmm. Okay, and then on this, when I did civil procedure, it was again, I used, uh, it's a great video on the art of war. The art of war and civil procedure, what do they have in common? How do you break those things down? Okay, so there's a lot of storytelling and building yeah. up subject matters. And that builds community. As you build stories that can be shared you cut across the uh, the divisions that are just normally there. Quite true. 
Uh, so we got 33 seconds. 33 seconds. Yeah. I guess we can head on back to, we, we answered the question. Yeah, we can go back. Okay. All right. Well, I um, will see you guys back in the main room. Oh, looks like people are back, coming back. We're back. You're back. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. So one of the things you were supposed to do, uh, sorry for that garbled uh, chat. Uh, my computer is doing a little quirky things. But anyway, for the person who agreed to be a reporter, could you please post at least one of your group questions or problems? in the chat. And I'm just gonna give you people a minute to do that. Oh, these are great, thank you. Community uh, building or inclusive, yes. What do we mean by class community? That's a great question, I'll answer that. <laughs> Include more than the loudest students, how to encourage student to student. How do we do it better? Casa. <laughs> These are great. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to think, and one of the things I'm going to do is look at um, some of the part of it is like why to create community. And we're talking about community. We're really talking about multiple communities. And a number of you have, um, I some of you asked about this, but there's so sort of in the literature, there's kind of three main communities. And one is the community where it's the community of the whole class, like the teacher and the students. So you wanna create that community. You also wanna create community where the students are comfortable interacting with each other. And third, there's this community of learning where the students are feel like they're part of the community of the skills or uh, substance or the combination that you're teaching about. So why do it? Um, people often ask you, I'm sure they've asked you this, I get asked this, what do you teach? And when I'm feeling a little bit, um, I don't know, pejorative maybe, I say students, I teach students, which is not usually what people wanna hear, but they kind of go, oh, duh. But the point is we teach humans, we teach, live beings and that makes a difference and it really matters. I was at a teaching and learning conference a while ago and I was talking about the importance of what they call the soft skills, but which actually are hard skills such as social emotional intelligence skills, listening, teamwork, collaboration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one participant in the, in the session said, why do we have to do that? We're just teaching them to think about the law. And it's like, no, the, right? the adage is that, we, that law schools are about teaching students to think like lawyers, but that's just too narrow. What we do is we teach students. So first of all, we try to teach students to think like lawyers in writing, because if they can't do that, they're not gonna make it. And secondly, we want to teach students to act like lawyers, to behave like lawyers. And that's a whole range of interpersonal skills that they need to learn. So I just want to say we're teaching humans. So we've got to keep that foremost in mind. So what is the research out there? This is just going to be like very, very cursory tip of the iceberg, even if that. 
Um, but there's been a lot of research on brain and emotions and learning lately. And I'm not going to get into all of the details of the, neuro, the neurosciences and the amygdala and blah, 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 blah. But I'm just going to give you some of the highlights. So this quote, the more positive the climate, the more students are likely to learn. Now that may strike many of you here, probably people who come to this conference is like, well, duh, yeah, I knew that. But I think it's helpful, like, um, like everything we do as teachers, that we be intentional about it, that we think about it and that we be transparent about it and that we explain to students that we wanna do that and that we're trying to do that. So uh, Nilsson and Goodson, this online teaching at its best, one of the things, there's a lot of helpful information in their, in their text, but one of the things they do is they synthesize a lot of studies and they poured through all the studies and they just met a study on, okay, what do instructional designers, cognitive scientists, um, teaching and learning scholars, everybody, what do they, what are the common themes? And they came up with 17 different themes. A lot of them have been talked about already today, like active learning and feedback and things. But one of the things that they talk about is the role of emotions and how important they are. A second source, I'm just gonna let you read this quote. For those of you in the car, Educators may support learners' motivation by creating an emotionally supportive and non-threatening learning environment where learners feel safe and valued. So this goes back to points that were made earlier, such as um, Ellen Murphy referred to this, I think when she was talking about presence, a number of you have referred to these different components in the sessions that I've sat in. Um, Amanda Nolan talked about it when she was talking about on the very first day, the first plenary about student motivation and engagement. So the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine um, came out with a book about 20 years ago called How People Learn. And it had a lot of information. Uh, How People Learn Too is where this quote comes from. And that Pink came out in 2018. And similarly, this is a whole community of people who just looked at the data, looked at the surveys. Now there's, and came up with like, okay, here are some fundamental principles. They also found that of course, there's a lot more work we have to do and a lot further we have to go in terms of doing research. And one of the caveats about all these studies, of course, is that they're not on law students and, the other thing is that they tend to fall into this, uh, the acronym that I recently learned is WEIRD, which stands for, these are all studies generally done in Western countries where people are educated, where they are industrialized, they come from industrialized countries, societies, they are rich and they are democratic. So that's, that's a limitation on all these studies. But for right now, since we're teaching law students and we can at least try to harness what that research is, not just take it at face value that applies to everybody, but that it applies to many of our students as far as we know. So this is a quote, emotions are in essence, the rudder that steers thinking. This is from Mary Helen Imordio and Mordino Yang, um, and she's written a couple books about this and a lot of articles, but um, she studied sort of brain science and learning and the implications. And so we feel, therefore we learn. So this is the opposite of what, you know, sort of people like earlier thinkers like Descartes said, which is, it was all about thinking. And that first quote I asked you to look at, which is, oh, emotions impede learning. In fact, we need emotions to improve our learning. Now, obviously there's limits on this, right? So too much stress, too much negative emotion blocks learning, but we can't have it. We don't wanna just say, this is you remove your emotions from the learning process because we can't make connections. We don't remember things. They don't stick into our long-term memory unless we have, we, have to have some sort of a connection to the material. So how to build a community. And now I just wanna give a plug to Tessa Dysart and Tracy Norton. They have put together this book, 
Law Teaching Strategies for a New Era Beyond the Physical Classroom. It's coming out by Carolina Academic Press in August this summer. And it's full of suggestions about a whole range of things. So I'm just gonna touch on a couple of these. But before I do that, um, I want to just have you stop for a second and think about what your goal is from this session and what your colleagues in your chat room, if you were able to be in one, what their goals were or what problems they wanted to solve or how they wanted to build community. And I want you to be thinking about yours and theirs because oftentimes as teachers, or certainly I have found this true, is that if I'm stuck on a way to teach something, I can talk to a colleague, a colleague who's not even close to in the same field or area. And they'll, they will suggest things to me that I won't have thought of because I'm too locked into my own trying to teach remedies or torts or advanced writing or whatever it is. And the other thing is sort of a general strategy, which is talking to a colleague is always helpful because they come up with very creative ideas often. And the other one, of course, is asking your students. Um, some of my best teaching ideas have come from students. And one way, in fact, that I think we can help develop communities is by asking students, how can we develop a positive, effective learning community in this course? So I wanna share just a few ideas. Russell McLean um, from the University of Maryland, he talked about uh, learning space as a haven. And I just heard this recently at the AALS's New Law Teacher Conference, which was last week. But I love that because he said he doesn't want to have a completely safe space because he wanted people to take risks and risks were kind of scary. It, you have to have courage to take risks. So here's what he came up with. So Haven, standing for humility. So we have to be humble. We have to acknowledge our limitations. We have to be authentic and transparent. A number of sessions I've sat in on over the last two days, I've talked about both of these features, but I think we can't hide who we are. It shows. And students are like kids and dogs. They can tell when we're off and when we're not being genuine. We have to be vulnerable. I think that goes along with humility. Show empathy not, and non-judgmental. So we're trying to listen and learn rather than attack people or uh, castigate their views on a particular subject. So, and then I really like this last piece that he and also other people were talking and they were talking about how to address issues of race, racism, the diversity and inclusion and belonging in the classroom and sort of assume good faith that most people, if they say things that are hurting the community, don't assume that they're not doing it intentionally. So here are some suggestions. In addition to Haven, I think one of the Key things here is that that can be really helpful and a lot of people have talked about, which is setting the expectations early. So that may be starting the class by saying, yes, these are my expectations or let's develop uh, community guidelines for how we're gonna interact and how we're gonna be professional because that can really help set the tone. And setting the tone for the community is really important to do early on. So students have that going forward. Some other points, view students holistically. Um, I can't tell you how many times, especially, I, I'm, I'm getting better. So I've been teaching for a couple of decades, but I'm getting better. Um, viewing students holistically, every time I've thought that a student was, um, off or being, I don't know, maybe mean or blowing off class or something. And I've, I try to have a one-on-one -on -one with them and I'll invite them into my office back in the old day, now on Zoom. 
and say, help me understand what's going on. And oftentimes it turns out that these are people, these are students who have a whole host of other demands on their time. Um, one of the sessions I was in earlier talked about, you know, having high expectations and, and still being demanding and rigorous because that's what students are going to need in their legal careers. But I think it's important, as other people said, be, um, it was in Sarah Berman's sessions, is like use grace and be empathetic. So recognizing that what they're facing is challenging and that they are multiple dimensional. We don't just exist as law professors. We have other lives, or I hope so. Being confident about being human, um, I think that oftentimes we worry about like, um, I'm not going to sound authoritative enough, particularly if I'm a new professor, if I'm a, if I am a professor of color, if I am, if I look really young, or if I'm really short, if I'm a woman, if I'm transgendered. But whoever we are, we should just be confident and own the fact that we are humans too. We have flaws and that's okay. And we're gonna be okay with that because the students are gonna to have to be, we wanna model a community where people can make mistakes and where people can be um, okay about saying, I don't know the answer to this, but here's what I think it could be. Being confident about the fact that it's okay to be wrong. Admit errors, I know many times um, the adage that was said to people, because I have a background in teaching elementary ed, and they said, you know, don't smile till Christmas or before winter break. Um, I think that's totally wrong. I think you can admit errors and apologize when things don't go well. Tell them what, how you're going to fix a situation and move on. And again, Many people talk about like in law practice, one of the worst things is when you have people who are dominating a conversation who are what's the phrase is strong and wrong, and they won't back down. So I think it's a really important for us to model for our students like this kind of community building behavior where our where we can um, show them that it's okay to apologize. Try first to understand that kind of goes with my uh, point earlier, which is that good faith, assume good faith. And use the pause button. I've seen a number of people use this really um, effectively during this conference at some of the sessions. And when I say use the pause button, I think that when we're in class and something has happened, so let's say there's something that's either, um, it's a trigger comment, it's offensive to, you know it's going to be offensive to some people in the class. It's okay to stop and say, I just want to pause here for a minute to think about what was just said. Because I think that also models for students the experience that they have, they're going to have as lawyers, and that they have in the classroom, which is sometimes they get thrown a question, they're not sure, and it's okay to stop and pause and collect their thoughts. Some other suggestions. So these are things we've heard. Um, I think many of you are familiar with these, but the introductory videos, maximum of two minutes. I've seen other people talk about like introductory videos, like an introductory video about you and yourself and what you're willing to share. And then another introductory video um, about the course and sort of what you're excited about. Um, and then Ellen Murphy told us today that maybe students didn't find that so valuable, but I do think they're valuable. I find them especially valuable when the students do them. One, it tells me how to pronounce their name. Two, it gives me a lot more information about them. And then if I'm having students work in groups, I tell them, you know, you should go to you should go to look at if you're working in a group with the other people's videos and see what you can learn about them. Um, individual meetings. I picked this one up um, from people a few years ago, and I've been doing it in my in-person classes where I just ask people to meet with me, find, so in-person, so find the office, find out that it's not terrifying to talk to the professor alone. Now we do them over Zoom, but students schedule them, and it's, um, they're short, they're maybe five minutes, seven minutes, maybe 10 minutes most, and it's just a chance to, 
say hello and touch base and find out something about them. Virtual student hours. I love this from our keynote on Amanda Nolan talked about student hours. Um, I know people have talked about, yes, office hours, student hours are obsolete in person. Um, I still think that there's a value for presence. And so making student hours available both in your class, in person if they want, or on Zoom. Um, Anna Elbrock, my colleague, talked about these and other people mentioned this, videos previewing upcoming classes, video is summarizing previous classes, and then announcements working as a bridge. And we talked about, um, in Anna Elbrock session, we talked about like, okay, these were really helpful for students in a hybrid program or an online learning program, but that actually they'd probably be helpful for everybody. A few more suggestions. Use students' names. This is huge. Um, I actually, so I don't know about the rest of you, but I usually would take attendance um, by in the bigger classes like torts or something by sending around a sign-up sheet. And then with um, teaching in this wretched uh, concurrent teaching with some people on Zoom and some people in class, that just didn't work. And so what I did is I actually had a tendency sheet where I would actually call out their names and say, hi, I see you're here, Tracy. Hi, Emily, great to see you. Laura, welcome. Jennifer, thank you for being here. But it just helps set the tone of involving students and hearing their names. It's like music to their ears help them to collaborate. That's so helpful for them because then as other people talked about this, um, Susan and Cynthia just talked about it in their session on assessment and using formative assessment about, it's so helpful to hear that they're not the only ones who are lost. Reach out to students who are absent and behind. I think that one of the things that happened is it's really easy for students to disappear. And I tell students in my class, you're not going to be able to hide. I'm going to come find you. And if I haven't seen you engaged or participating or turning in things that are due, um, I'm going to reach out to you because I'm worried about you. I want to make sure you're OK or if there's something that we need to help you be successful in law school. Random supportive emails, give feedback. We've heard that. Get feedback and share results. So that's a really helpful thing in terms of building community. Um, I typically have our university teaching and learning system administers what's called a midterm assessment. Um, and what it is, three questions, what's working well and helping you learn, what's not working well and we should stop, and what other comments do you have? And one year, um, I got these back and a number of students said, uh, quite a few students had said in their comments that what wasn't working is that people were being really rude in the class and it was affecting their learning, it was impeding their learning. And so I showed that to the class and immediately like four people interrupted the class and said, that's not true, nobody's being rude. And I realized like, okay, they don't even, it's like people who don't have a, a musical ear or a good sense of smell or color, they just didn't recognize it. We did a poll in class and it turned out that the vast majority of students said people were loud and it was um, it was disruptive to them. So I was new teaching torts at that point. It was the first time I'd been teaching like a big doctrinal class. And so after I gave that feedback to the students, I could say, okay, so sometimes when you raise your hand, I'm not gonna call on you because I need to hear from other students. I'm gonna continue to cold call because I want a diverse range of participants and diverse views. Um, and if you just shout something out, I'm gonna ask you to stop. And it changed the dynamic. I didn't have these sort of loud vocal voices. So here's your next activity. Back to the breakout rooms. One takeaway from the session. So again, these are gonna be short. These are gonna be elevator conversations. Um, possible to solution either for you or for somebody in your group, um, a step you might take to build community, or something else that you learned from this conference that you want to remember. So I'm going to put you back in your breakout groups.
Okay, those of you who are here, I'm gonna put you in a breakout room. I'm gonna think there she is. So Sandra, you were talking about uh, doing the video, uh, short video, sending that to students. How about them doing short videos and sending them back to you? In other words, if you're doing introducing yourself for two minutes, let them introduce themselves for two minutes. I have my yeah. students do weekly impressions. So every week, everybody must submit a written impression about what worked for them, what didn't work for them, what they would change. Every single week. And they get graded. They get one point to the source that's final grade per, per week. And that forces everybody to think and allows me to change what I'm doing on a weekly basis. And I will do it on the on the spot if I catch some student not ca not figuring out what we're trying to get at. Um, but I think this idea of using videos back and forth might be helpful. Um, worth an experiment. So Sandra, were you talking about using a, doing a welcome video even though you're going to be teaching back in person this fall? Yeah. I was thinking about using it, you know, just to start creating the community. I usually send an email out, but, and I think Manuel's idea of having them do one back. There was also someone talked about Padlet. I think that was Ellen Murphy. And she talked about that bulletin board. And I thought, well, that would be good too, because, and that would kind of combine both the things that Manuel just said, it, they wouldn't be making a video. Maybe they can on Padlet, I haven't checked it out. But if I put my intro video there, then they can, I can ask them prompting questions and then we can start creating the community that way. Mm -hmm. It's very different because civil procedure, I have 75 students and then I have 18 in legal writing. So the, the community is really different, but I think what she was saying about, you know, students saying, no one's being mean. It's usually the people who are being mean that don't recognize that they are. And um, so I thought some of their, her suggestions on that was pretty good because they'll be really different from year to year. My big classes are really different. Mm -hmm. Do you have, ever have the issue where you've got the students? I mean, probably everybody's had this, but the one who likes to talk a lot and it's usually off topic <laughs> and the, the student, they digress. And you can see everybody else, you know, everybody else in the room, the eyes are kind of glazing over and they're tuning out. I always have a hard time sort of cutting that student off without wanting to, I mean, I don't want to be rude, but without seeming rude or, um, uh, you know, shutting them down. Because I, so that's always a, I don't know, because I don't want that to affect the environment because I try to have a really sort of low key, informal seminar sort of environment. So any suggestions on that would be really helpful. Say thank you. Yeah. Literally say thank you. I heard you need yeah. to go over to the next topic. Yeah. That generally, the, that generally it works. It works yeah. a lot. Being yeah. very polite, thank you. But, and that eventually some may get the message, some will never get the message. Yeah, I know some people just, yeah. Well, I think it's that personality, right? Like that's yeah. their personality. Um, I think I think he's right, and I I think it doesn't feel comfortable, and I think that might be gender or cultural when things don't fit for me. I'm from the Midwest, and our culture is very not, you know, <laughs> the the West Coast is a little bit more. Yes, yeah, stop it. Um, but. So I think my reticence to doing that has to do with how I was raised. Um, but I think I might combine it with talking to them as well. You know, yeah. say, this is, a, in my opinion, you know, this, I want to hear your voice and your voice is valuable, but I need to move on. And so when I say, mm -hmm. thank you for your input, that's what I'm telling you. So I might let them know or her know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if they don't learn it from you, they're going to learn it from some judge. And the judge is not going to be very happy, and it's not going to go for a long time. It's going to be over very quickly. Yeah. I'm an arbitrator, so when I tell counsel, thank you, I mean, thank you. Yeah. I heard you. 
Thank you. Done. Anything <laughs> else? Put no, but anything else? Put it in writing. You can do that to a student too. You have anything else that you want to say? Please put it in writing. Send it to me. So it's a, it's a thank you. It's a stop. But send it to me. I want to hear you, but not here, not now, not this way. I'll hear you in writing. And I'll get back to you. I promise. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Yeah, have them send you an email. Yeah, thank you. And if you want to continue this conversation, send me an email about it. And promise I will read it and I'll get back to you. As long as you keep your promise, they, they've had the, the opportunity. I like that. All right, good tips, thank you. Take care. All right, we're heading back. All right. So thank you all. I appreciate the comments in the chat. Unlike um, some of the other presenters, I am not gifted at going back and forth and reading chat while I'm talking. I just, I'm limited that way. But I saw some really good things. And one question I can respond to, two things that I saw in the chat um, that I want to address. One is what learning management system or how do you, where do you post videos? I don't know what other people do. We use a learning management system as Canvas. And we, I just post a discussion board that says introduce yourself to the class and people can just upload a video. Sometimes they use formats that don't work for everybody. So then I just reach out to them and say, you know, I, I need, you can just record it like on Zoom. They can record it um, in Canvas and just post it. Um, I think the the other question is like, how can you be vulnerable, admit mistakes um, if it's if you're pre tenure, you know, because of the student evaluations? And I don't. I'm the last person to make light of that and say that that's not a real thing. So of course, with all of these suggestions, you have to do what works for you and for your students and for your institution. Um, yeah, it's a lot easier to say I was wrong and I made a mistake when you've been teaching for a while and you have tenure. There's no question about that. But I would just encourage people to be thinking about that uh, because my sense is that students really value the community we build when we show our humanity. And part of that is acknowledging that we're fallible, we're humans. So in the, uh, let's see, two minutes, thank you, Emily, left. Um, if people could just use the chat function to share one takeaway that they've taken either from either something they wanna do or something they've taken away from the conference um, or uh, either to build community or just in general in terms of this new era in which we're teaching. So if all of you could communicate on the chat, that would be terrific. Video introduction, even though I'm going back to face to face. Yes, I started doing it in a, I started doing it in a face to face class and then just migrated over when we went after the pandemic, but really, really helpful. And I think it's kind of this blended use of technology that we can really use to augment the out of class experience. We feel therefore we learn. Yes. Short surveys, great. Small groups, yes, excellent. Surveys, prioritize giving feedback. Yes, there's lots of ways to um, give feedback. Um, some people at this conference talked about it and I hope they will post their materials. Virtual bulletin board, show of humanity, elevator speech. Great. So. I have one minute left and I want to say um, thank you. Thank you for still being here. Thank you, Institute, for all that you do. The Institute is a wonderful community and I hope that all of you will stay involved and participate as you can because it's just an amazing resource with terrific people and lots and lots of helpful information. So thank you all for participating. Thank you, Sophie. That was fantastic. I always get so many ideas, uh, you know, every time I hear you speak. And it's always, and I'm sure everybody did from this entire conference, that at least was our hope, that you have, you know, a whole plethora of ideas 
uh, to take away and, you know, uh, an embarrassment of riches, you know, too many to choose from. Um, and kind of going back to a tip that Tracy made in her session, you know, don't try to do everything at once. Um, start small and work incrementally, uh, but hopefully there was, you know, some gem um, that you can take away and, and implement in your courses. Um, just a couple of kind of wrap up notes here. First of all, just wanted to thank you all for coming. Um, you know, we're, we regret that we couldn't meet in person this year, uh, but I think next year we should be able to do that. You know, um, fingers crossed and we get back to the more normal times. Um, so we should have our regular uh, conference, our summer conference next year in person. Um, we haven't decided on a location for that. So, you know, stay tuned, um, I'll be on the lookout. Next week, you should get an email from me with um, a link to an online evaluation for this conference. Um, please, it, it'll be short and, and painless, I promise. Um, take a few minutes to fill out the application. We really do value your feedback. We pay attention to it. We use it to shape our future conferences. So we would love to hear from you um, on, on how everything went. Um, if you haven't signed up for our alert service, um, as Sandra has mentioned it a couple of times, we don't bombard you with emails. It'll be you know a couple of emails a month uh, and nobody can cross reply or anything. So it'll just be the one email from us. But um, we usually send out um, a link to our blog with teaching ideas or article reviews you know, on um, articles related to teaching. So I think that's a really uh, good uh, resource. So um, you can just go to our website to sign up for that. It's um, www.lawteaching.org. If you haven't looked at our website before, please check that out. It's got a lot of great resources on it, uh, you know, uh, rubrics, all sorts of assessment materials. And then we'll be posting the um, materials from this conference there probably sometime next week you have to give me a little time and so I don't um, bombard my um, communications person who uh, manages the website for us but we'll get that up very just as soon as we can and also the um, videos from the uh, plenary sessions so Emily Lindsay Sandra anything I forgot I have two quick things first mm -hmm. of all Kelly and Lindsay as the Bowen representatives for the institute really did the lion's share of the work in getting this conference together and certainly all of the technology logistics and scheduling so we are super super grateful to them sandra and i kind of just called into some meetings every now and then and then like logged in so uh kelly and lindsay really did did the vast majority of the work for this so we're grateful and appreciative speaking of being appreciative if you're a thank you note writing kind of person and you saw a presentation that you particularly enjoyed i would encourage you to reach out to the to the presenter but also consider reaching out to the presenter's dean and just let some people know let some admin people know that we're doing good work and we're doing good important work about teaching and learning um in a way that has a positive effect on law schools around the country so that's all i would add it was great to see you all <laughs> right uh sandra Lindsay, you guys have anything I just have one thing to add. If you want to get onto the listserv, you have to go. You have to go to our teaching blog pull down page, and then that's where the subscription is. So, if you're interested in being on our listserv, that's where you go. So, just go to the ILTA website, go to the blo teaching blog pull down, and then the subscription submit will be there. All right, Lindsay, you're good. Okay. All right, well, I think that's it. You guys, thanks so much. Uh, it just, it's been tremendous uh, learning from everybody over the past couple of days and um, go forth, have a great summer and have a fantastic fall semester when hopefully, you know, things are a little more normal. <laughs> Take care. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.